a little more full of energy today than on Monday. You guys doing all right? All right, so today I want to talk about um, kind of our, our first, really the, I guess, technical aspect of our course. Um, last time we started talking a little bit about kind of typical water quality parameters that we're interested in, why we're interested in them, and a bit about that. Today I'd like to start by talking about, okay, we've got these different water quality parameters we're interested in, now how do we measure them? Um, especially how do we do it in a field where we don't have a laboratory all set up and um, all of our fancy equipment in place ready to go. So that's, um, somebody's saying that I have no audio, but it, it looks like I do. Hang on. want to get a little bit of your feedback about kind of uh, communication sessions, um, how much input you want uh, with EndNote, for example, with technical writing, uh, some things like that. Some of it I'm, I'm going to just give you some input, uh, but I want to scale your interest and, and kind of get some feedback about that. Okay, so uh, last time we talked about sort of drinking water, wastewater, some of your typical contaminants. Really, we can break them down into chemical and biological for the most part. Some exceptions if you want to consider um, maybe some physical aspects. Uh, usually, we can kind of catch them uh, either way. OK, so uh, starting with chemical, uh, most of what we're going to do if we're taking a, a trip to a field site, and I, I kind of wish I thought to bring, bring the uh, actual device, maybe I can next time, um, we would probably bring some sort of a portable colorimeter. If you've been in a lab, which I'm sure you have, you undoubtedly used a spectrophotometer of some sort. You maybe caused something to change colors and then observed how much color was there uh, using the spectrophotometer to take some uh, amount of light to see how much light was passing through the, the sample. Um, an example would be my my bottle here, if you look at the, uh, the light coming through it at an angle, or uh, just taking a look at it through the light, you can see that, well, the bottle itself is blue and it's absorbing, you know, it, it's, uh, well, it's absorbing everything essentially but blue, so it appears blue. So if you look at the light hitting the screen back here, it kind of has a blue look to it. Um, so it's the, kind of the same principles, how much light is being taken out of our different samples. And it turns out, we'll talk about in a moment, that's a very handy quantitative tool because we can correlate that directly with the amount of stuff in that sample. Here's a picture from uh, a study here using a colorimetric method to see how much nitrate is in this, essentially by that, that color absorption. Okay, so that's a very common tool we would use is some, some sort of a portable color measure, right? So the fancy term is color colorimeter or even fancier, we could get, we could say, a spectrophotometer. Okay. Uh, otherwise, we're often going to be testing kind of a core uh, suite of um, parameters. We'll have a pH test, conductivity, that gives us some information on total dissolved solids. So, kind of like how salty, sort of. Like, you could take this to get an estimate of how salty is your, your brackish water, for example. Um, it's going to be not not exactly the same as TDS, uh, total dissolved solids, but it's not going to be too far from it. Temperature is going to be uh, important to record, it's something that obviously you have to do in the field. It's not hard to do, but you want to do that because that's going to give you information about chemical reactions, how quickly they're going to happen, how much dissolved oxygen can you expect at max, given a specific temperature. Um, so a lot of these are... We, we will measure them even if, let's say, there's no concern that the water is a little bit too warm for the community to use. That, that's obviously not a hazard, but it tells us something important uh, about the water in general, and it's important to have our water quality characterized pretty well um, across a lot of different parameters. Uh, the 
dissolved oxygen is one of those, along with the oxidative reduction potential, so redox potential here, ORP. We'll often measure that as well because it's going to tell us something about how likely is it that maybe arsenic is in the dissolved form rather than a, a, a form that's going to be able to be precipitated, right? It's going to tell us what might we need to do in order to treat the water to get proper coagulation uh, to occur, um, something like that. So we can get a lot of information from uh, these physical, if not chemical, tools. I'll talk a little bit more about those tools in a moment. Um, and I, I kind of jumped ahead of myself earlier, but then we can use colorimetry for um, things that we don't have a simple, like, stick the temperature probe in the water and get your reading. Um, not everything is uh, conveniently measured with a colorimetric method, but there's quite a lot that, that is. It really depends on whether or not you can add something that's going to react with your chemical to change the color, right? So. You can do this with iron. Certain, a certain complex will form with iron and it'll turn the water pink, for example. It's like phenanthrolene. As, as one example, you can measure okay, how much is in iron 3 plus versus iron 2 plus with, with methods like that. Okay, so how does it actually work? And what would this look like? Um, if I remember to, in, in next week, I'll bring uh, a device or two to class to kind of show you, have you take a look. But, most often, if you go to the field for this type of assessment, what you're going to do is you're going to bring some kind of a multi-parameter probe that's uh, rugged so that you can uh, take it to the field. Typically, these will have some data logging functionality to record it for you. Sometimes if you wanted to leave it there for the course of the day and measure some variability across some day, that would be a little more like a kind of an environmental study, what's happening with that system. Um, a lot of these have that functionality. Uh, a lot of them will also have GPS functionality, so you can record exactly where you took a sample. Um, again, important um, in a lot of cases, so you can maybe make a map of where your data varies, how it varies over spatially. So a lot of convenient functions, and it'll look something like this. It'll have this big um, probe here that's going to house really several probes all in that one casing. It's uh, kind of open to the water, but also protected, so it's, you know, you're not going to bash the probes against the rock if you stick it in the murky water. And you know, if you hit something, that's, that's hopefully not going to be the, uh, the end of your probe. So essentially what that's going to allow then is for you to measure lots of these um, physical and chemical parameters that are simple to measure with some sort of a, an electrical device. So most of these processes are going to operate on the, on the basis of getting some sort of electrical signal. Um, the a temperature probe, for example, the fancy term is a thermocouple. Essentially, all that is is a um, essentially two wires or you know, a closed loop, and it's passing through a resistor made out of a, a carefully designed um, metal. That when that metal changes temperature, the resistivity of electrical flow through it changes a little bit. So when you take that and let's say you dip it in your hot tea, then you know the resistivity increases, so your voltage requirement increases, and then you take it back out and it cools down. Same thing as your your typical your digital thermometer if you're taking your temperature. That's chances are it's a thermocouple, it has a little metal um, end on it probably, and it's gonna use that method to determine the temperature. Of course, you know, a regular thermometer with mercury or Nowadays, it's uh, some alcohol formulation. That's simple and easy as well. That's not digital, so you have to like take an analog visual reading of it. Maybe a computer could do that. But typically, if you've got a parameter probe like this, battery powered, you're just going to send a little bit of current through there and see what you know what the temperature is. Very reliable. A pH probe um, would also be in one of these units. These are essentially measuring the pH, right, the amount of the protons. The way these work, pretty interesting, is we have this fancy probe here, and right here at the bulb, it's going to be permeable to at least protons. Um, that's kind of the idea. There might be some other things that can go in and out, but the idea is to let um, H plus specifically enter that 
uh, enter into there and try not to have other stuff. So then, when you have an acidic solution, a lot of H plus goes in, and that means then when you have a some sort of a reference electrode over here, and you measure the voltage um, comparison between these two solutions, if you have a lot of H plus here, the conductivity increases and you can pass electricity through that solution easier, um, and that's going to be in comparison with the electricity passing through here. Um, turns out that pH probes are very often uh, accidentally destroyed by letting them dry out or by putting them in pure water. So you think that, okay, maybe if this is a dry object, maybe we can just leave it in the air and no problem. Or you might be thinking to yourself, oh, let's keep it clean, let's keep it in, I've heard you're supposed to keep it wet, let's keep it in pure water. Both of those will destroy a pH probe. <laughs> so you actually have to keep it in an electro electrolyte solution, um, and if you were in the field and had nothing better, your spit would be better than um, pure water uh, for the probe. You can clean it later, um, but anything that has some salt so it's not pulling out all the electrodes and messing up the chemistry there, um, that would technically ruin the pH probe. So kind of interesting thing about pH probes, if you're ever doing any kind of environmental sampling, keep in mind you're, you, have, you have to have some care for that probe. They're pretty robust otherwise um, and simple. Conductivity probes are uh, kind of kind of case in point here. There is a small conductivity probe right in there measuring how, how easy is it for water or for the electricity to pass through the water. So you'll have with this parameter, multi-parameter probe, you'll have another conductivity probe that's really just sending electricity across across a couple wires and measuring how easy or how difficult that is. So the the less salt, the less electrolytes in the water, the harder it is to pass electricity through it. Um, if you have very pure water, it's going to have a high resistivity. It's actually how we measure um, the purity of our high-grade laboratory water. It's like, is it is it near 18 mega ohms is kind of the, the standard. That's the really high-quality water. So if you're ever reading a scientific journal article or something, a lot of times they'll say, we use double deionized water resistivity greater than or equal to this, or something like that. Um, so that's super, super pure water. Um, if you take salt water, it's going to be much, much lower resistance than that. So, um, so mega ohms, say 18 mega ohms, that is ultra pure in the standpoint of um, ions, right? Maybe it has viruses, but no ions, <laughs> right? So purity, of course, is, that's a subjective a little bit. OK, oxygen sensors are fairly similar. Essentially, what you have is another probe that you've got an electrode to see, uh, or a pair of electrodes to see, OK, what, how is electron flowing, and how is oxygen in particular uh, interacting with it. And in that case, you have some sort of a membrane, so if you've got a let's say you're a pair of electrodes here, maybe a plus and a minus, inside some container, well, you'll have a membrane where O2 can go through and not much else can. So your oxygen probe um, is going to allow oxygen to get through and interact with those electrodes. There's some electrochemistry there uh, that occurs and gives us a quantitation of how much oxygen is getting in. Okay? So all of that can be housed in this little guy, and almost all of that has to do with processing some electrical current. In fact, if you think about it, and if you, the more you learn different analytical tools in chemistry or kind of in environmental sciences, what you'll find is, at the end of the day, we, we almost always resort to using some sort of a signal that is digital at some point. Even our uh, colorimetric uh, methods here, essentially what's happening is we're sending a we shine a light, that goes through our sample, now let's say we have a sample here, so there's a little bit of light coming through, and then we collect that on a detector, and the way this detector works is it's kind of like a photovoltaic cell, it, it receives a light, and that creates a little bit of electricity, so and it you know, tracks that depending on maybe the wavelength or whatever, and so then 
that sends some electrons. And that gives us, you know, maybe some some amount of electrons during that that um, irradiation, or you know, maybe it would go from zero, and then it's now continuous light. You're shining. You measure how how much that increased, right? So it ends up as a digital signal. So it turns out that um, if you have anybody, any friend in electrical engineering and in college, or roommate, I have two of my roommates were electrical or computer engineers, and I heard a lot about digital signal processing. Uh, from them and how dreadful it was, and then I ended up taking a environmental data analysis course, and which I actually liked. And we used MATLAB to to do some signal processing of environmental data. And so I was like, oh, hey, I have I have like a small appreciation now for what you guys are suffering through. But but my on my end, I'm just looking at you know maybe diurnal cycles of uh, you know, sea level with the tide or something. You know that that was kind of what I was learning. So it was a bit more relaxed than their. Uh, Electrical, electrical engineering and all that, uh, but it's kind of neat. You'll you'll see that from time to time, um, and you'll see a lot of overlap with the different fields that way. All right. Uh, any questions or anything on uh, these probes? They're pretty they're pretty helpful. Uh, you'll see them fairly often if you haven't taken a lab where you've used them. I suspect you will. Um, if we get to go to Nicaragua, we'll definitely be bringing uh, something like this. Yeah. Um, so CH like for long term, like storage needs to be stored in electrolyte solution. If it's part of the rest of the probe, like if it's just one probe among like four, like so you store it all in the electrolyte solution. Yeah. So the the question is, would you store it like for a multi-parameter probe? Would you store that whole thing in electrolyte solution? Um, it probably would depend on the, the, I think that would be okay to store the whole thing in electrolyte solution, but I'm trying to remember, I've, I've used one that actually was pretty much this model, I think. I believe you could detach this uh, sheath here, that's for protection, and then you could attach a smaller um, electrolyte uh, solution end cap thing just for the pH probe. Okay. Um, I think that's the way they would do it, but I think the other probes would be fine kept in a, a, a typical electrolyte solution, but it's a good question. Okay, so a bit more uh, technical stuff here for the Beer-Lambert law. Essentially, we can use this for anything that's absorbing light, um, so any color, uh, whether it's UV, um, and it, it's the same principle actually applies for fluorescence. So if we wanted to measure some the fluorescence of something, the same principles are at work here. Um, specifically, um, we need to make a colored product uh, or have something that already has a color. So we'll see this in all sorts of different um, applications. Again, kind of coming back to that digital signal, it's because we can get a reliable signal from light um, and translate that into a reliable uh, quantification tool. So. Uh, we can use all these paints, for example, or here we see it in action with a laser pen going through this uh, pink solution. And you see the greens being absorbed, and it kind of after maybe a few centimeters, we're not really seeing much light come through anymore. So we see that all of that green light has been absorbed by about this, that distance. <coughs> okay, so the deal is we have this Beer-Lambert law, and that tells us that the intensity of light is essentially proportional to the amount that has been absorbed, or the amount of absorptivity of the solution, and how far it travels through that solution. Right. So it's a the T then is tran the transmission is equal to the intensity you start with compared to the intensity you end with. So coming back to this little drawing where we have maybe a cubet in our system, we have a light shining like some sort of light source, and we have a little bit of light coming through it, and that detector. So we would have an initial intensity of light, and then a final intensity of light. So, so that's what we're talking about, and T then is kind of transmission. Probably transmissivity is the technical term. 
So essentially, what portion of light made it through? Um, we can talk about the absorbance of light, so how much light is being absorbed by the, the solution there. Let's say we have maybe some color to it. So then the absorption, that would be some quality of that solution. Um, and we can relate that to the negative log of T. So negative log of I over I minus, uh, over I naught. That is um, the absorption of light. So we can relate that to um, this parameter here, essentially the molar absorptivity, so for some molecule, for some chemical, given some molar concentration of it, we know that it's going to absorb a certain amount of light per centimeter. And when we say a certain amount of light, that's a proportion, right? 50% of the light every centimeter, or 20% of the light every centimeter. So that's um, per molar per distance. Okay, so we have um, like, so if this guy is 0 0.5, that's like 50% of light per mole per liter per centimeter. Uh, that'd be per one centimeter. So it gives us a very technical definition of how much light is being absorbed. Um, very convenient there. Um, and that's, again, multiplied by this B, which would be the path length. A lot of times in a colorimetric sense, you know, if we're using a colorimeter or something, almost always we, we have a little cubit that's like one centimeter. So just simplifies that, kind of drops out of the equation nicely. In a, a field case, maybe you have a different container, and then the, the unit that you're using, the colorimeter, has to have, you know, the calculation in there that it's two centimeters or whatever. Um, so it, it's can definitely change that and it doesn't matter so much. So long as you have light still coming through. So if you have a very concentrated solution and you wanted a five centimeter path length, um, you might have to dilute it to get your uh, uh, an appropriate answer. That's a, an important consideration if you're in the field and you're working with some sort of a water sample. Um, we've run into this issue in the past when I've done field work is okay, well, you have this sample, and it's got a whole lot of, let's say, nitrate. And if we kind of take a look back, this 45 mill milligrams per liter of nitrate, that's a very strong color. Um, maybe we're taking a look at some agricultural runoff water. Um, packed full of nitrate. Well, at some point, we're not sure, because it's absorbing all the light, we're not sure exactly what concentration it is, because we can't get any higher than that. Like any higher than that will give us the same signal. It's absorbed all the light. So we have a potential limit there, and we have to bring with us to the field some pure water. Right? So if, if you're ever uh, pre preparing for field work, you have to prepare a lot of contingencies there. Um, you might have to dilute. Um, in some cases, in a more analytical sense, in the laboratory, maybe you're trying to increase your detection limit. Uh, some spectrophotometers will have a cell where you can put in a long path length cuvet, so five centimeters, so you can really measure more absorption for a very weakly absorbing solution. So all sorts of stuff you can go with that. Uh, finally, C for the analyte concentration, um, that's that per molar. That's what gives us power with this tool to actually say how much stuff is in there. That's really what we care about at the end of the day, is the fact that that relates um, one to one with how much light was absorbed, which we measure through that intensity change. There we go. So very technical uh, description of this, you know, stuff absorbs light. <laughs> right. Any questions? You guys have probably seen this a lot before, um, at least the light absorbing tools. Yeah. All right. So. How do we then make the color happen? Uh, this is kind of the fun part. Um, if you're doing uh, chemistry in a lab or something, the kind of the fun thing is to make colors change, right? Make, make something change colors. So there's a, a couple things 
you would probably have at least something like this little handheld colorimeter. Um, some of them are, you know, like that one's fairly small, and essentially it's got, um, what it's doing is it, it has a little casing right here that I think you can pull that off and put it on the top there. And essentially what it does is right now we've got a sample inside here that would look like that, or maybe like a little ampule thing like this. And that's just going to be sitting in there, shielded from external light by that little black cover, so that there's no external light coming in. And then it's just going to shoot a little LED, most likely, or some other small lamp in here, and just pass it through the, the sample, and then have a detector, something like that. Uh, maybe it's arranged, you know, maybe the geometry is different, but it's going to have a sensor and a light. It's going to pass the light through, hit the sensor, and quantify that. And you're going to have some portable uh, um, sample um, tube to, to use. Now, to get the color, a lot of times what, what you'll do is you'll have either a little ampule that's a, a glass container that has some reagent inside of it, um, and then you break that, and either you, you allow the vacuum, so they've got these little vacuum chambers, either you let that vacuum suck in water, so you, um, with that you essentially vacuum up some water, your sample water, and then it's reacting with your reagents. Um, that's, that's the typical way. Or maybe you add powder from a little powder pack into a little vial like this guy, shake it around. A lot of times you'll have to wait 10 minutes, 15 minutes, let that reaction come to completion. And essentially, these little packets or ampules are really neat because they they contain all of the reagents that you would have needed in a laboratory. Um, like if you do a, a manual test for phosphate, for example, yeah, or phosphorus in general, you have to do, you have to need like ascorbic acid, and you need like um, citric acid, you need like these reagents that come together with several different, uh, several different chemicals, probably at a very low pH, maybe with um, sulfuric acid, and so you need a lot of very specific settings, and you typically would store all that in a refrigerator, and then combine them at the right amounts, uh, and then you get your color, you wait 10 minutes, and then you can take your measurement. So normally that's all going to happen in a, you know, a wet lab analytical uh, laboratory. Then you can do your measurement on, with your system. The neat thing is, if you put it in a powder and get it all set up just perfectly, you just do it right there in the field. Um, these vacuum chambers are actually really nice because you can prevent the stuff from reacting with oxygen. Uh, because some of these are sensitive. You need to have them refrigerated or uh, in, in a vacuum would be an alternative so they don't decay on them. Right? So there's, it's actually quite a brilliant um, solution to having high, highly analytical, highly sensitive molecules all packaged up so that you can just take it to wherever and, and do some field analysis. Okay, a few things to consider. Maybe if you have to take samples and you can't analyze them right away, which is uh, quite frequent, you know, depending on where you're at and your field situation. Um, and let's say maybe you want to take some things back that you just don't have a field tool to use. So a few things to think about then, if you're doing these field analyses, is, okay, well, how do I preserve the chemistry of the solution as it was there? So if I need to measure how much arsenic is in the water, and I want to make sure I'm differentiating between um, you know, arsenic-3 and arsenic-5 in the water, something like that, for example, we ought to take all those um, physical and you know, the multi-parameter probe measurements, and then we have to think about, okay, do I need to acidify this to prevent any transition from one to the other? Do I need to protect the headspace? You know, maybe there's some sort of volatile organics involved. Um, maybe oxygen is going to react and uh, cause the arsenic to change, change forms. There's a lot of things you have to think about, and then you almost always want to put that sample on ice, keep it cold, keep it refrigerated, essentially. Um, so you need to bring coolers and ice and all that. So there's a lot to think about when doing um, field sampling. Uh, again, it's pretty ideal if you get one of these reagent packs, maybe, maybe a dropper, drop a couple of um, things into it, and then you're good. Um, 
but again, it's just really nice if you can do that all in the field, but if you don't, you, you really have to think about uh, what other considerations could impact your, your system so that you can trust your data. Okay, so that brings us to uh, the microbial samples. Uh, again, obviously pretty important here to, if you want a, an accurate measure of how many microbes are in, in your water, um, chances are you're going to have to do this measurement um, by some sort of a culture method. So if you're wanting to culture your, your microbes to see how much they're going to grow, then what you need is a way to incubate them, put them on some nutrient stuff, and then incubate them overnight. But that's usually pretty difficult to do in the field. Uh, there are some portable incubators. I'm going to show you some techniques that are uh, quite interesting to that end. Um, and there's a couple of different ways we can count microbes. Um, a lot of times when we're interested in kind of identifying the microbial pathogens or the potential for microbial pathogens, essentially microbial contamination, the, this um, colony forming, colony counting method is probably the, the most straightforward in a context where you don't have fancy equipment. Okay, so there's certainly a, a variety of techniques. You can do PCR if you have maybe some organisms where you, you think, okay, well, if there's some kind of E. coli, we can take part of the, uh, the DNA chain and, and see if we can amplify that. If there's any E. coli in here, we should get signals from that. Maybe you check multiple different types of organisms and see if you get signal with the PCR. That requires a lot of, um, a lot of equipment, and it does not give you information on very much anyway on how many E. coli were there and specifically it does not give whether or not they were alive. Okay, So when you do the PCR technique it's just kind of is that DNA present? Alive or dead? Like that's, That kind of information is not there. So we normally uh, revert to or resort to this kind of a, a colony forming. Now we're not checking specifically for the pathogen so we have to keep in mind it's an indicator not not a guarantee that it is contaminated, we just, if there's lots of stuff forming colonies, then we, we think that there's probably a good chance there's fecal contamination uh, to worry about. There's a distinction we can make. Uh, here we have the, what we'd say, total coliforms, really just anything that's colony forming, any bacteria that are forming colonies on some standard nutrient materials. And then we have we can call them fecal coliforms, or perhaps a little more accurately, like uh, thermotolerant coliforms. Um, there's a couple of different um, definitions here. So for total coliforms, we define that as a functionally, it's a functional class we, is how we define it. So any organisms that are going to grow that metabolize lactose to produce acid and gas. Um, so not all of these are fecal in origin. Some of them are just out in the wild normally, right? So if they're just out in the wild normally, chances are good they're not pathogenic to us. Um, we're not actually concerned about them. So this this uh, category contains um, it's a, a bit of a faulty indicator in that you could have a completely false positive and not know it. Right? It could be completely uh, um, completely wild stuff that's not actually harmful, no fecal contamination. So a little bit of a risk there. Uh, the, the fecal coliforms or thermotolerant ones, the same is a little bit true, but it's a little more likely to be um, indicative of fecal contamination. So we've got uh, facultatively anaerobic, so they require um, conditions with no oxygen, tend to be rod-shaped, gram-negative, non-sporulating, which I don't um, has something to do with their physiology. And they are able to grow up to 44 degrees Celsius, which is a bit higher than, um, you know, the, that's a little bit higher than some can tolerate. So you'll you'll weed out just by that some of the coliforms that may maybe just wild, you know, growing in, in the wild. Because typically you would incubate essentially at body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. Um, so in terms of a uh, in terms of Fahrenheit, this is a, a bit over 100, right? So 37 is essentially our human body temperature, 98, 98.7-ish. 
then 44, then it's probably 105, something like that. Okay. Another thing you can do with these techniques is uh, when you plate them and count these colonies, because that's essentially what you do as you get a, uh, a, a plate of this, it's kind of like jello, but jello for bacteria. They like to eat it, they're happy, got everything they want there. Um, and essentially they'll, they'll grow these little colonies, and then you're like taking this little plate and you're counting in your mind, like probably use a permanent marker, say one, two, three, four, five, and just count how many colonies you get there per plate. And then you know something about how many colony forming units you had in the amount of water you spread on that sample. So it's going to be a small amount of water, you spread it over the sample, um, essentially mix it around uh, carefully, trying to get all the bacteria on the sticky agar, not on your little stir thing. And then you count. Um, so there's a couple cool things you can do with staining. Sometimes the uh, agar itself will have like a, a reagent where certain bacteria, if they do this process, um, perhaps the uh, you know certain metabolic activity, they're going to change their little colony color to be blue instead of pink or, or vice versa. So there's some extra indicators you can get to differentiate there. But essentially, in either case, it's sort of a bulk test how much stuff is going to grow and then how can we identify it from there. If you think about it, doing microbiological work in a field is going to be difficult because if you ever have worked in a lab, especially a mic microbe related lab or biology lab, you'll recognize that it's easy to contaminate stuff. Um, and my skin, the desk, anything you touch is going to have some microbes on it. And especially if it's something on a living person that's, um, you know, it's not like, a, I don't know, the soil or, or something. Even the soil is going to be plenty, tons of bacteria. But like, if you think about something that's living on me or living on you, that's likely going to be able to grow on media if you give it lots of nutrients and high temperature, right? There's going to be plenty of room for contamination. So uh, one of the interesting challenges is how to keep a, a sterile system and how to sterilize things without your fancy pressure cooker autoclave things, right? So there's, there's some uh, interesting stuff about that. I'm going to show you um, one particular portable incubator kit that I have in, in my lab. It, Again, if we go to Nicaragua, um, I think they have a couple of them there, and we can bring our own as well. Um, one thing I'm going to mention before we get there is the amount is of bacteria is very important. So if we take, you know, that plate we had a moment ago, and we want to know how many bacteria are on here, well, if you look at these two plates, you can kind of count. You know, you could, if you spent the time, you could count exactly how many colonies are there. And in the, on the, the one hand, you can count how many are blue and how many are pink. But if you had too many, you would end up getting like a, a blanket. And then you cannot distinguish. So it only takes like 300 colonies before you can, you're really like going out of your mind trying to just, you know, see the difference. And then you're not sure if that was an overlap or not. It, it becomes too numerous to count, this is how we call it. So uh, too many to count or too numerous to count. You'll see this in bio data um, uh, all the time if if there's too many. So this one would not be too numerous. Um, you can usually trust it if it's somewhere in a reasonable range. Like if you just have one bacteria colony, you're like, well, maybe that's contamination. Maybe that's stuck to the pipette too. Um, when we were diluting it, I'll show you in a moment, uh, or something like that. Maybe we can't trust that, but if we've got 10 to 20 up to about 300, you can usually trust something like that. So there's there's kind of a range. We have about two orders of magnitude to work with, something like 10 to 300. This, to me, looks like it would be around 100 colonies, uh, whereas this is probably something 15 to 20 range. Okay, so with that in mind, if we have too much contamination, what do we do? Well we have to dilute. Um, or if it's too dilute in the first place, we'd have to concentrate it maybe with some filtration. So uh, thinking about uh, dilution, if we have something highly concentrated, maybe a, a really nasty uh, well that cows drink out of or something, it's their kind of uh, where the, you know, kind of agriculture scenario in a little pit, got some mud, muddy water, and you wanted to measure that, 
Well, you might have to dilute it with pure water or uh, sterile water, rather, um, quite a few times. And usually you'll use actually a sterile saline solution so the bacteria aren't super stressed by the, um, by the pure water. Osmosis, all that, osmotic pressure will, uh, will pull all the salt out of a bacteria and that bacteria is no longer very happy. Um, so when you're diluting, you have to take, what you'll do is typically take a serial dilution. So you take your sample, take a portion of that, and then maybe you take one milliliter into nine milliliters, and then you can repeat that. That would be called a serial dilution. And that's essentially, if this, you had, let's say, 10 to the six bacteria or colony forming units per, let's say, milliliter, then this one would be 10 to the fifth, and then 10 to the fourth, and then 10 to the third, and finally, when you get 10 to the second, that's about 100. Um, you know, maybe that's 2 times 10 to the second. Then you're at a point where you can count. Right? So you have to adjust that and try multiple um, dilutions in the, in the field because when you take a sample, you don't know. Right? <laughs> maybe you look at it and you're like, that's nasty. I'm going to dilute that a lot. But you don't actually know. right? So when you, when you do this in a lab, you're going to have to, or, or in the field, you have to check quite a few um, to see, to, to make a guess and get some data about how much bacteria is actually in your, your sample. Okay, so I have a couple videos. Um, if you were in my class last semester, I apologize, you've seen this already, but um, this is a portable test kit. Uh, this is the Del Agua system not really an advertisement for them, but they, they provide these instructional videos and I think it's kind of neat because they go over several things that you really would have to pay attention to in the kind of field context, how to sterilize a system in kind of a clever design. In this one, they're going to take a, a membrane and use a membrane that um, is going to let water pass through and then catch the bacteria. And so then you filter some amount of water. Rather than do the dilutions, you say, okay, well, I'm going to only filter a tiny bit of water, maybe five milliliters. And then I can say, how many colony forming units are in five milliliters? Or if it's a very clean water, maybe you go up to filtering one liter through it before you see. So then you get a, a difference in the, the metric there. So I'm just going to let these, these play. I have to figure out the sound system for a moment, so bear with me, but we'll get this going in just a moment. coming through the speakers? Uh, computer noise? Okay, so this may just work. Cool. Alright, I don't think I'll let it play the full 12 minutes. I don't think we need all of it. Um, and I've got another one that falls. This, this one's a, kind of a processing the water samples. Um, of the pad dispenser. Pad dispenser allows us to put the pad, which holds the media, which is the food for the bacteria that we're trying to grow, um, without actually touching the pad because we don't want to contaminate it. So I'll take the lid off there and insert it that way round onto the top. And then we're ready to go. And it dispenses pads very simply. So this is one of our Petri dishes. We sterilized that earlier, you remember. I'm just going to dispense a pad into the middle, ready for us to put some media on. Jeff, what happens if we haven't got a pad dispenser? Well, we want to make sure that the pads remain sterile, so we can use a pair of forceps. We flame the tips just to make sure that we kill anything that might be transferred. And then without cutting the ends, we can very simply take a simple single pad, drop that into the Petri dish in exactly the same way. 
and then it's the same process with the media. Process is identical to the media from there. And again, remember nice red media that we made earlier. What we're going to do is we're going to take sterile pipette, holding it with the end that end, not that end, because we don't want to contaminate that as well. How much media does it take per population? Between two and two and a half milliliters. Each pad is very slightly different in terms of the amount that it's going to suck up. So you really need to kind of do it by eye. But very simply, in a circular motion, so there's complete saturation and it's starting to soak around the edges. What happens if there are bubbles? Bubbles are no good. Bubbles are going to cause a barrier between the membrane and the food. And then you're not going to get the bugs growing. And that's going to cause a problem with the result later on. If you do end up with bubbles, there's two ways in which you can get rid of them. The first is to stab them with the end of your pipetta. That will get rid of the very large bubbles, but you'll notice it doesn't get rid of very many. So first thing you need to do is squeeze the end of your pipette and suck the bubbles out much like a vacuum cleaner. If you find you run out of squeeze, squeeze again and suck them out. Until you're bubble free. And that plate is now ready for the membrane. So now we're ready to start processing the microbiological samples. What we'll need obviously is our sample water filters, the petri dishes that we prepared earlier, the filtration manifold, the vacuum pump, a lighter and the forceps, and a China graph pencil to mark up the sample after we finish processing it. The first stage is to get the filtration manifold set for filtration. Turn the head upside down and insert it onto the vacuum cup, and then turn the cuff around to the point whereby you can easily take re remove the two and hold them in one hand. You place it on top of the uh, filtration manifold in order to ensure that the inside doesn't become contaminated. As you start to assemble the sterilized filtration manifold, on occasions the black rubber o-ring prevents the filtration manifold head from sitting into the vacuum cup. A good way to alleviate that is ensuring that you press evenly across the base of the vacuum cup, push it on and turn it slightly. That should create enough suction to hold the head on. The next stage is to ensure that our forceps are sterile, to slightly flame those. And while those are cooling, we can get set with a filter. Peel the two corners apart, peeling the clear plastic film uh, down the front and the white opaque backing down the back. You'll notice that there is the filter on the bottom, which is white and gridded, and on top of it is protected by a blue paper layer. So we don't use the blue paper? No, it's non-porous. Uh, it's only there really to protect the filter itself. You'll notice on the top of the filter as you peel back the blue paper, there is a gridded sequence. That's in order to be able to assist you when you're counting in the analysis of the samples. Very carefully and gently grip the filter by the edge, ensuring that you don't try and crease or bend it. As gently as you possibly can, place the filter gridded side up into the middle of the filtration manifold brass disc. Okay. Now, rotate the locking cuff to ensure that the filter is held, the funnel is held in the vacuum position. Okay, taking our sample water and filling it to the 100 mil line, to the top of the two uh, white scored marks on the actual funnel. the vacuum pump into the side port and then gently squeezing the pump 
itself, and you'll notice that it starts to pull the water through to find a vacuum. Important for that to be quite slow. The turbidity of the water, which we've previously analysed, will have an impact on it. However, the, if you go too fast, there are certain likelihoods where you will cause the filter to either rumple or crease, uh, and sometimes you can end up with mild compromises of the filter, in which case you'd need to run that process again. Okay, as the water starts to pull through and get nearer to the end of the filtration, you'll start to see the surface of the water evaporate away from the filter. It's important not to suck too much air through the filter after it's finished that, the um, suction. Okay. Move the vacuum pump, and again, showing that our tweezers are sterile because we don't want to be introducing contamination from the tweezers. Release the locking cuff to the point whereby, again, it's easy to lift both off in one hand. Gently remove the filter from the top of the brass disc. Again, being very careful to hold it only by the edge. Place the filter funnel and cuff back on, and then rolling it from one side to the other in order to try and prevent air bubbles, place the filter on top of the saturated pad, ensuring that they overlap as exactly as is possible, so you don't end up with air bubbles in there. Place the lid on the Petri dish, mark the sample with the China Graph pencil, and return it into the stack. Okay, the first thing to do at this stage is to turn the incubator on in order to give it some time to run up to temperature. Okay, so incubating is pretty straightforward. They put these in the incubator, make sure it's on, make sure it's the right temperature, all of that. It, they actually have like a car battery in them, so these incubator units are pretty heavy, so it's not quite a car battery, but it's enough to keep the, uh, the, the thing at the right temperature for um, 18 hours, 16 to 18 hours, basically overnight. Um, so it can do that, or you can plug it into a, an external power source uh, for that. Um, I was hoping that in this video they were going to show sterilizing the actual filtration chamber, because you have to sterilize that between each sample so that you're not recontaminating. And the way they do that is really interesting. Um, so again, we don't have like a autoclave or some pressure cooker in the field typically to, to do proper sterilization. So instead, uh, plus the plastic probably couldn't handle that heat anyway. So instead, what essentially what they use is formaldehyde, but not directly formaldehyde. Um, what, and they probably have another video on there to show that, but essentially what they'll do is they'll take um, a little bit of methanol. So methanol is flammable. You've know, probably heard about it before. Um, you can burn it pretty easily. So you put like a, a small, maybe like a, a teaspoon of methanol in that little metal chamber. You light it on fire and then you let it burn for like half a second or two, maybe maybe a second or two. And then you put on put on this, uh, that, that other part that you're trying to sterilize that the tea has, um, Right now it's sitting there on top that it was holding the sample and it's got the membrane um, support system. You put that on top of it, blocking the oxygen, and then as methanol burns without oxygen, you actually end up creating formaldehyde, which disinfects that whole thing at a pretty low temperature. It gets maybe up to 70 or 80 degrees Celsius um, during that, that process. So the plastic remains safe. You get formaldehyde, which is a potent disinfectant, and then, you know, you just don't inhale it when you open it back up, right? Um, and so it's actually really a, a creative, creative thing um, there. I, I thought. So I've got a one, one more little bit shorter about kind of actually reading the the plates once you've incubated them. 
So I'm just going to show you this uh, real quick. So your samples would have been incubating for anything between 16 to 18 hours. The next thing to do is to turn off the incubator and then take your samples out and begin counting them. This needs to be done within 15 minutes, otherwise your samples may actually cool and this may cause the colonies to change colour and will affect your results. So once your plates are all laid out on the table, the first thing to do before you actually start counting is to check the two controls have worked. The first control is the media plate control. So this would be a sterile filter pad followed by two mils of hopefully sterile media and then topped off with your sterile membrane. Following the incubation, if this plate has got no colonies on, this means that your media was in fact sterilised correctly and we can trust the rest of your results. The second control would be the filtration apparatus control. So, so following sterilisation of your membrane filtration apparatus, you would then put a sterile filled pad at the bottom of this dish, followed by clean water run through your hopefully sterilised apparatus, then topped off with a sterile membrane. Following incubation, if this plate has no colonies on, this means that you correctly sterilised your filtration apparatus and you can trust the rest of your results. Once the controls have been looked at and checked and you can verify that they've worked, the next thing to do is to start counting the colonies. From a previous run, we found that this particular sample was heavily contaminated and we were unable to count the colonies. If you find that this is the case with your samples, you can always dilute them with clean water in order to isolate individual colonies, which are much easier to count. It's also best practice to run all your samples in duplicate. This way, when the results come out, you can compare them, and if they're very similar in counts, you can then eliminate the possibility of human error. When it's time to start counting your colonies, you need to find the plates that have between 3 and 300 on each plate. You also need to find the ones that are between 1 and 3 millimetres in diameter. This is made slightly easier by the fact that the membranes supplied with the kit have gridded squares on and each square is three millimetres in width. You can also use these lines to go along and count your colonies, making it a bit easier if there are a lot on the plate. Alternatively, you can actually split the plate into four quadrants and then count each quadrant individually. Sometimes colonies can actually merge together, making it difficult to count. If this is the case, you could use the hand lens supplied with the kit and use this to zoom in and decipher how many have actually merged together. The other thing to look for when counting your colonies are the yellow colonies only. These are the firmer tolerant comb forms that we're looking for, which are able to produce a particular type of acid which lowers the pH of the media, rendering the colony yellow. The pink colonies are the types of bacteria that we're not really interested in, and these aren't able to produce that acid and they remain the same colour as the media, pink in colour. Once you've decided which colonies to count, all results can be recorded in the daily report. Oh, okay, so obviously uh, data recording is pretty straightforward as well. So let's see. come back to slides. All right, so any, any questions or uh, curiosities about, about that? It's a pretty neat system. Um, I thought hopefully that was useful to kind of see what it takes to do kind of that microbial testing in a, in a scenario where they could just do everything on, on a counter. You know, you could bring it in here, you could bring it to a, a picnic bench somewhere. As long as you had some pure water uh, available and the, the right, uh, right stuff available, you can actually do quite a lot there. So, so kind of coming back to where we started, there's you know obviously several key contaminants, uh, several that are recommended by WHO for specific uh, guidelines. There are absolutely more than this, but if we think about it, we can cover a lot of them. Um, let's say arsenic, we should have colorimetric. Um, so if we have a colorimetric probe, a multi-parameter probe, and 
the incubator system, we're really covering most of these because, of course, E. coli is going to be uh, the incubator. Oops. Um, pretty much incubator. Uh, fluoride, nitrate are both colorimetric. Um, e. coli, thermotolerant. Uh, turbidity we can get with the uh, colorimetric, uh, just essentially looking at how much light is scattered. So that would be there. Um, Multi-parameter probe can give information on a lot of these other ones uh, in terms of, like, like like I said earlier, the arsenic, what state is it likely to be in, all that sort of stuff. And it's just generally good to characterize water um, thoroughly so that we can make connections, react, reaction rates, um, oxygen saturation, stuff like that. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that multi-parameter probe is going to give us that plays into a lot of it. So really... <coughs> And those are kind of the three things you want for a, a pretty pretty good characterization of or, or assessment of water quality. Um, certainly there might be uh, other things you're concerned about, maybe pesticides, and you're going to need some fancy instrumentation for that. And so you're going to have to take that, take samples, um, and pro you know, protect them so that you're not going to lose your analyte in transit and maybe ship them back to a laboratory somewhere. All right, so that's that's the uh, um, the content I have. I do have a, a kahoot for you. Uh, give me some feedback. Um, any questions, comments, thoughts before we do that? All right, please. This time, uh, log in with your eight nine number so I can uh, just track attendance that way. Uh, no, no spaces or hyphens, just the 8-9 number um, will make it very convenient for me to import that into Excel. All Raise your hand, wave at me if you need another moment to get in. Okay. All right, give me a thumbs up if you're you're set. If you had to raise your hand. And if it, if it's really just not working and giving you trouble, just uh, you shoot me an email. That's no problem. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, start it here. So how much time would you like me to spend no, spend on an EndNote workshop sort of deal to give you some training, you could bring your laptop, learn how to use that EndNote software for reference management? The quiz is going to say there's a right answer, but there's not technically. I just filled that in uh, whatever I thought would be your likely answer. Your, minute because I know that the uh, anybody attending online has at least a five or ten second delay and it like, gives me a 20 second option 30 second option and a one minute option so one minute it is okay so so everybody's at least a little bit interested um, some of you feel like a, an entire lecture would be helpful some of you most of you about half and some just a, a few a little bit okay that's that's good for me to know I'm, I'm happy that 
nobody's like completely disinterested and it'll just you feel like it'll, it's a waste of your time. Um, so I, I will I'll probably aim for something about half and I'm happy to do a little bit more as we go or um, revisit things uh, along the way. All right. Um, what about kind of a presentation skills type of thing? Um, as we think about your... Uh, Are you saying like verbal, when it comes to verbal, like presenting your body? Yeah, like so... How it looks? Both. Okay. Both. Like, so standing in front of somebody, projecting your voice, what are you doing with your hands, you know, just fidgeting, you know, what are you, are you uh, over here hiding behind a desk, or, you know, what's going on with that? Okay, so, again, almo almost everybody's at least somewhat interested. Um, okay, thank you. Good to know. And lastly, uh, I'd like to know... Um, Regarding technical writing skills, so uh, what kind of pitfalls to watch out for as you're uh, writing a technical report? So it kind of tie into thesis writing for anybody doing uh, kind of research. Um, how much of that? And you're going to get some of this regardless. I'm just kind of wanting to kind of hear from you there. Okay, so that even more so. Okay. Good to know. Um, I'll definitely keep that in mind. Uh, and before I let you go, I have to remind myself about our deadlines for the uh, for our first presentation, so to speak. Uh, when did I say the uh, the thesis statement? We're going to do that in class. That's um, okay. So I said topic selection. That's right. I need to talk about that. So topic selection is due on Monday, and then. Um, then you have a little while before the thesis statement is due, so you'll have some time to, to write that paragraph. Um, uh, regarding the topic selection, let me go to Moodle real quick. I did post a Google Doc there. Um, I want to show you that, and then I'll let you go. So just bear with me a moment. So this is actually the uh, last time I taught this course. This, I accidentally found that thing that I was telling you about that I wanted to find because um, it brought me to Moodle 3 or whatever. That's kind of funny because I was just resigning myself to not being able to find my old Moodle course. There it is. Uh, so one, one sec. Let me... Uh, not, not mad about that, but I was spent so long trying to do that on my own time, and now it's like, here, while, while you're in front of class, why don't we... Uh, I'll give it to you there. Um, or maybe the IT people just added that just now and I hadn't seen it before. No, this is what I was expecting. Okay, anyway, um, here we are. It, I've created a section for a research paper. Um, it's got the rubric and instructions and this topic sign-up sheet. That should take you to a Google Doc. Um, and the way I've set it up is you all should have access now anybody with the link and so essentially what I'm going to say is you pick your your major topic this will be listed on the left whichever one you want scroll down quite a bit and then on the right I have subtopics listed for each of those and so let's say I want it to be right here I should be able to edit that and delete that and say my name there looks like I can't so I need to fix that for you but that's where it's going to be I'll fix that and send you an email just to announce that formally. Um, I should do that today. So maybe there's a. Okay, I think I just need to be logged into a Google account. So I think once you log in, apparently I'm not logged in right now. Once you do, I think you should be able to edit. I'll double check that. Um, question.
I did I did do that when I created it, and I got a shareable link so that anybody with that link should be able to do it. But I think it's just I need to be logged in, or you need to be logged in with something to edit. Another question? I'm logged in and it won't let you yeah. Okay, so I will go fix it then. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right, that's it. Have a good have a good week. Good.